Hello friends, so this is going to be a talk on Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, and this is a rare disorder, however the boards like to throw this one at you, and it's pretty unique, so it's worth talking about just to uh, get things sort of clear. It can often be confused with multiple myeloma, and there's a good reason for that. It is a disorder of uh, cells that are of lineage of the plasma cell. However, it's not quite a disorder of the plasma cell per se. It's actually a disorder of a cell that's a precursor to a plasma cell. So it has a lot of similarities to multiple myeloma, but uh, there are some very key differences, and that's what we're going to talk about. So this is a clonal proliferation of what I like to call pre-plasma cells or cells that are on their way to becoming plasma cells, but at some point they get deranged and they proliferate. And they're actually called lymphoplasmacytic cells. So if you see that name come up, you should be thinking Waldenstrom's. Most commonly, I would say actually almost always, they secrete IgM. And IgM is a larger uh, antibody. So that's going to be important as far as some of the symptoms. It is a rare disease. Only about 1,500 cases are diagnosed in the U.S. per year as opposed to myeloma where you've got tens of thousands. And like multiple myeloma, it is a disease of the elderly. There is a increased incidence among uh, patients who have family members that have, pla uh, that have blood cell dyscrasias, so any kind of blood cell disorder, uh, cancerous blood cell disorder, so multiple myeloma, uh, MGUS, uh, any kind of leukemia. So there is some kind of genetic basis to it. And then there's also about one in every five patients have Ashkenazic Jewish background. So those are th some things to keep in mind. The chief symptoms of Waldenstrom's are quite different from what a patient with multiple myeloma presents with. So remember, multiple myeloma Primarily, they're going to present with your crab symptoms, so symptoms related to hypercalcemia, renal impairment, uh, bone fractures, and so forth. On the other hand, with Waldenstrom's, you're going to have uh, primarily platelet-related bleeding, so uh, bleeding of the gums, easy bleeding if they're brushing their teeth, for instance, nose bleeds, just very incidental bleeding from very minimal trauma. Weakness can be present, often is present, and then there are also symptoms related to hyperviscosity. And the reason for that is because IgM is a large antibody, and they can form, uh, it can form polymers, and the result of that then is a increased viscosity of the blood. So some of the some of the effects from this hyperviscosity can be headache probably related to minor visual changes, diplopia, and so forth. So those are some things uh, that are worth keeping in mind because these are very unique symptoms uh, that will distinguish it from some of the other uh, blood cell diseases. So platelet-related bleeding and hyperviscosity. Now, monoclonal IgM a lot of times will have autoimmune properties, so this can relate in some nervous system disorders. And primarily what that uh, autoimmune property is, is this antimyelin. And so what you get is a peripheral neuropathy that seems to resemble Guillain-Barre syndrome in that it's symmetric and ascending paralysis. It's also sensory too. Ultimately, how we diagnose Waldenstrom's is by bone marrow biopsy, and it's a disease that's managed. It's not cured. We don't have a cure for Waldenstrom's. However, it can be managed. We can manage the, uh, the hyperviscosity. We can manage the symptoms, but there is no cure. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, uh, this is a proliferation of IgM secreting lymphoplasmacytic cells, which are similar to plasma cells, and that they secrete... Uh, antibodies. The symptoms are, and the ones that I starred here are going to be the ones that you should really, really remember because they're some of the chief symptoms. So platelet-related bleeding, and primarily that's because the IgM can cause destruction of the platelets. So bleeding from the gums, nosebleeds, and petechiae, uh, hyperviscosity, which can result in dizziness, headache, blurry vision, diplopia, papilledema, and Raynaud syndrome. Remember, Raynaud syndrome is where you get that, uh, uh, that uh, whiteness at the end of your fingers when you come in from the cold. Uh, so you're getting distal hypoxia. Uh, 
Organ infiltration is another thing. It's not quite as common as the bleeding and hyperviscosity, but when you see it, it's going to be primarily hepatomegaly and splenomegaly. Rarely you can see diarrhea and malabsorption, and that's just due to the fact that you've got, uh, that you've got infiltration of the bowel. And then peripheral neuropathy, as I mentioned, is sort of the autoimmune effect of the IgM. And it will be a, a, a distal and symmetrical uh, neuro, uh, paralysis. So the labs, uh, when you order the labs, what you should see is a CBC that shows normal cytic anemia. That's pretty common with any kind of dyscrasia of the blood cells. So that's not really telling you a whole lot. You will often see thrombocytopenia in patients who have bleeding. Of course, that's due to the fact that this is platelet-related bleeding. But what you will see on, uh, on your CBC if you have a smear, uh, which you should always get in any patient with bleeding or blood-related symptoms, is the Rouleau formation. And remember the, what the Rouleau formation is. Uh, I don't have a picture of it on, uh, a picture of it on this slide, but uh, I do have a picture of it on the multiple myeloma uh, section. And what it is is just these red blood cells that stick together in a chain. And we call that a Rouleau. And what that is is it's, uh, its antibodies are attaching to the red blood cells that are then attaching to more red blood cells and more red blood cells, and it forms this chain. And so we call that a Rouleau formation, and that's very typical of multiple myeloma and also Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. As far as diagnosis, the best initial test is going to be a serum protein electrophoresis, just like multiple myeloma. And the most accurate test, which needs to be done to make a definitive diagnosis of Waldenstrom's, is a bone marrow biopsy. So this is a serum protein electrophoresis. Basically what this is, is you're taking the serum and you are measuring the proteins that are in the serum based on their weight. And normally you should have this very typical uh, graph of uh, how, these, how, how these various proteins that you have in your blood, uh, how they distribute based on size. So uh, closer to the y-axis here, they're bigger proteins, more further away, they're smaller proteins. So you have a typical area where your albumin shows up, a typical area where your alpha-1 globulin shows up, and then your alpha-2, and your beta-1, and then your gamma. So alpha-1, uh, these proteins are like alpha-1 antitrypsin, thyroid binding globulin, and transcortin. Alpha-2 is like haptoglobulin, ceruloplasmin, and alpha-2 macroglobulin. And then beta is transferrin and beta lipoprotein. And then your gamma globulins are your antibodies. So this is how it would normally show up. Now if you have multiple myeloma, remember that you have the M spike in the gamma region. It's called a uh, monoclonal gammopathy, either of undetermined significance or of determined significance if it's multiple myeloma. So you get a spike in your gamma region. In the case of uh, a patient with Waldenstrom's, what you're going to get is a spike in between the beta and gamma region. So it's not quite at the gamma region, but it's between the beta and gamma region. Why is this? Well, with multiple myeloma, what you normally have is a proliferation of IgG. In Waldenstrom's, you normally have IgM, and IgM is larger than IgG, so it's further down on this, uh, closer to the closer to the y-axis on, uh, on the electrophoresis chart. Remember that you start off with big proteins, and as we go down, we have smaller proteins. So it makes sense that if we have an IgM proliferation, that it should be a bigger spike, uh, or a, a spike closer to the bigger proteins, rather than a spike closer to the smaller proteins. And so because you have a spike between your beta and gamma regions, that tells you that it's probably an IgM proliferation, and that's typical of Waldenstrom's as opposed to, uh, as opposed to multiple myeloma. Really, you should know based on your symptoms, but this is how you can tell uh, sort of uh, by graphs and charts uh, on your serum protein electrophoresis. So this will give you a big hint that it's uh, Waldenstrom's if it's between the beta and gamma regions. So as mentioned, the best initial test is the serum protein electrophoresis. The most accurate test, however, is a bone marrow biopsy. So even if you have a positive serum protein electrophoresis, you're still going to need to get the bone marrow biopsy because it's necessary for diagnosis. 
What will you see on bone marrow biopsy? You will see an abnormal proliferation of lymphoplasmacytic cells. And the pathologist will tell you this. So you're not expected to know what lymphoplasmacytic cells look like, but you are on the USMLE expected to know that lymphoplasmacytic cells are the cells that are deranged in Waldenstrom's. How do we treat Waldenstrom's? Well, the question is, is the patient symptomatic or not? Usually on the USMLE, the patient is symptomatic because the symptoms, they're going to give you symptoms that help you diagnose the patient. It's very rare that they're going, I, I don't think they're, they're ever going to give you a patient that's asymptomatic because it'd be difficult to diagnose Waldenstrom's in an asymptomatic patient. So in the presence of hyperviscosity, it's an emergency. So if they have hyperviscosity symptoms, such as uh, the visual changes or headaches, the patient should get plasmapheresis. And what the plasmapheresis is, is it's taking out the patient's diseased plasma and putting in normal plasma so that the viscosity of the plasma goes down. And then subsequently, they should be managed as an outpatient for Waldenstrom's. In patients that have symptomatic Waldenstrom's but not hyperviscosity related symptoms, so say they have bleeding uh, but not uh, visual changes or headache, then we put them on rituximab. And rituximab is now really the basis of therapy, the therapy of choice. Other things that can be used are uh, alkylating agents, uh, you can use fludarabine, but rituximab is the treatment of choice. And then asymptomatic Waldenstrom's, no medical therapy is necessary, but they should be managed about every three to six months by a hemato-oncologist. And so this, I, you know, I've been uh, kind of alluding to multiple myeloma, uh, and really the reason is because they're both B-cell related disorders. They have some similarities, but they also have some key differences. So they present completely differently. Waldenstrom's presents with bleeding, headaches, visual changes, organomegaly. Uh, multiple myeloma presents with bone pain, weak weakness, and fracture. Uh, the labs in uh, Waldenstrom's, they're pretty normal. You'll see some normocytic anemia, maybe a low formation. Uremia is pretty rare. With multiple myeloma, you will see normocytic anemia, hypercalcemia, and uremia is a little bit more common. On your protein electrophoresis, you'll usually see a spike between the beta and gamma region in Waldenstrom's, whereas in multiple, multiple myeloma, it's always going to be in the gamma region, right on that, on that gamma globulin area. Uh, the bone marrow biopsy for Waldenstrom's is an abnormal lymphocytic infiltration, and it's periodic acid shift positive. So that may be thrown at you on, on the test. I doubt it, but uh, now you know. And then with multiple myeloma, it's greater than 10% plasma cells. Treatment for multiple myeloma, if you go back and watch the slides on that, uh, we use CVAD uh, and bone marrow transplant. Uh, that's going to be uh, cyclophosphamide, vincristine, adriamycin, and dexamethasone. Uh, and that's only if the patient is healthy enough. So usually if they're under 70. And then we do bone marrow transplant followed by thalidomide or melphalan. Uh, if the patient is old or fragile or has other serious comorbidities that make us think they probably won't survive a bone marrow transplant, then uh, we take care of them on thalidomide or melphalan. If the patient has Waldenstrom's, it's uh, treatment with rituximab. So very different therapy for a very different disease. Uh, but I want to compare and contrast these because oftentimes there is some uh, confusion. And uh, I think that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about. Uh, there is, um, as far as uh, curative therapy for Waldenstrom's, I don't know if the USMLE is going to throw it at you. Um, uh, the best treatment of choice is rituximab, plasmapheresis, and emerging cases. However, uh, more recently, autologous stem cell transplants can be curative in younger patients. But in older patients who are in their 60s and 70s, who are primarily the patients where Waldenstrom is diagnosed, you're going to use rituximab or plasmapheresis. You're not going to be giving them stem cells. But if it is in a younger patient, stem cell therapy has more recently been used. But remember rituximab and plasmapheresis for the test. And that pretty much covers it.